This week on CrossFeed. Can you predict your death? England and Rome talk about women. Rome and Kennedy talk babies. Jesus burial certificate? I'm really sorry I brought the Jesus. But can I have some more? Crossfeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Rich Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio, near Cleveland. At least people know where you are now. Hey, Pastor Jim Butler out here in Boston area at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham. I uh, hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving and a blessed first Sunday in Advent. Yeah, Happy New Year, everybody. So, how was your Thanksgiving, Jim? I know the answer to this question. Yeah. <laughs> it was sick. Really sick. Quite literally. I had the flu. Came down with it Tom Dale. I came down with it Tuesday and um, had it right up through uh, Friday. So, um, I, I, I managed to eat some and stuff, but um, mostly I lost weight, so... <laughs> bucking the trend, huh? <laughs> yeah, bucking the trend. Not really hey, the way we recommend it, though. Not, well, yeah, that helped me lose a couple, a little bit, a, 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 you know, a few, a few extra ounces there. But as of yesterday morning, I was officially at 165, um, down from 178 when I started. Well, good for you. I'm quite a bit above so that. I've, so I have lost 13 pounds. I have 10 more to go. Now it'll be 155. Actually, if I weighed that, I, I'd be grossly underweight because I'm quite a bit taller than you are. So, are you really? I never knew that. <laughs> I suppose we've never met. Yeah, I'm six four. <laughs> are, are you really? Yeah. I never knew that. <laughs> See, you look shorter on TV. <laughs> yeah, you know, TV it it adds ten pounds, but it takes off a foot. So yeah. <laughs> He looks shorter on television. He looks shorter on A lot of our longtime viewers know this, but Jim and I have never met in person, obviously. Right. You know, we've been doing this show. Next episode is number 150, and we still have never met. <laughs> oh. Nah, here I did. I never knew that. Yeah, so. my, the pastor of my first church was 6'4 and weighed 395. No, mm -hmm. 295. 295. The guy looked like a linebacker for the pit, for the you know bears. Yeah, I'm quite a bit less than that. So, so, so yeah, Jim could be a you know an axe murderer for all I know. I, you know, never actually met him. Not that really meeting somebody in in person it's all of a sudden gonna you know, reveal to you <laughs> like oh. Wouldn't you like to know? Um, hmm. So, um, wow. Hmm. Hmm. I'd like to make a height joke here, uh, going into one of these things, but uh, can't think of anything. Um, but well, how was your Thanksgiving before we go and start talking about it? Oh, um, well, uh, first of all, uh, anybody that's subscribed to our podcast feed has seen or heard um, my uh, my Thanksgiving sermon. Um, I'm going to call it a sermon, monologue. And uh, hope it was a blessing to people. Love your feedback on that. Uh, feedback here was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, people really liked it. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's always the sort of thing that um, don't want it just to be about entertainment. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I got the, the comments that y you feel like you're there. Uh, I did the, the leper uh, from the gospel lesson. The Samaritan leper did some research on leprosy, uh, some research on uh, Samaritans and, and Jews and stuff like that, and, and tried to kind of pull that information into the story. Uh, it, was, it was interesting uh, research, and, and um, I thought it was pretty fascinating. My, um, my kids enjoyed it, and... Um, you know, so it's it's a it's an all ages kind of thing. Uh, parts of it are a little bit uh, graphic, but not too bad. Um, and uh, so so that was really it. And you know, I really enjoyed uh, doing it. I usually Thanksgiving's a really hard holiday for me to do, uh, just because it just it's it's like give thanks. It's it's all law, you know. 
And uh, so I, I usually don't really preach on giving thanks. I usually preach on how good God is, you know, and, and just which sort of produces the natural response of wanting to give thanks. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a strange holiday. Plus, it's just, it, and this, this struck me that it's a civil holiday, even though it's all about giving thanks to God. But, of course, at the same time, for most people, it's just Turkey Day. Um, so, and it's just, it's really about food and football and, and not about God at all, which is sort of ironic given, given the name of the holiday. Um, but then again, for a lot of people, Christmas isn't about Christ. So, um, but it was, it was a weird Thanksgiving for us just because it was the first Thanksgiving that we have not spent with, um, with the rest, with our extended family, uh, since we're just too far away. Uh, to go by my parents or my wife's parents, uh, we it was just us, and um, it was relaxing. You know, we watched the parade and watched the movies and stuff, and, and just kind of relax and spend time with the family. It was really nice, um, but at the same time, it, you know, it would have been nice to be able to go and, and visit somewhere. But since we're going to be going to visit over Christmas, um, it was pretty hard to justify a um, about a twenty to twenty four hour round trip for just a couple days. So, um, you know, I guess something to get used to for us. Yeah, of course, it's a 20, 24 hour trip one way. So, you know, don't, 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 don't worry about it too much there, bud. Yeah. Still got you beat. Well, yeah, uh, I'm just getting see. used to it though. You're used to it. So we're used to it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So dealing, uh, well, Thanksgiving course is when we're always, you know, one of the, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving, people, you know, really start pushing giving to the poor and giving to food pantries. Um, but of course, then there are poor that help themselves. And so it's a little short story here in Ellenwood, Georgia. Um, stole, um, <clears throat> from a, a church there in Georgia and, um, left behind a note that said, sorry, but I'm poor. Forgive me, Lord. Uh, you know, th the story really hit home for me because I don't know if it's just where we are or, or what, but I get probably once or twice a month at least, and it's been picking up um, people either stopping by the church or calling, stopping by our front door. Uh, within the past week, I've had like two, three different people um, that are looking for food, um, uh, you know, anything, I, I literally had a guy, um, uh, a week ago that, um, was looking for some, he was, he said he was living out of his car and, um, and so I, I hooked him up with a member of the church who works at an auto parts store to, um, get him a, a few parts that he needed for his car to keep it running. And, uh, and I made him a sandwich. And he was excited that I put mayonnaise on it. You know, I mean, it was just ham and cheese and, and he was thrilled. And, you know, so there's definitely a need out there. Um, mm -hmm. And, but then and you're, again, you're still, uh, your state's what I mean, what are you guys running at? Uh, something like 15% unemployment or something like that? Yeah, I don't know what it is, but it's, you know, it's not great. And, and we're, um, North Ridgeville is, is one of the more middle class, um, we're, we're, we're pretty much straight middle class as far as, uh, you know, the county. We've got um, two of the other cities in our county are quite a bit lower. Um, one of them has a, one of them's the kind of place, is the kind of town that you don't want to go at night. And, um, and another one is pretty close to that, not quite as bad. Uh, North Ridgeville's pretty, pretty calm that way. Um, and a lot of people are moving into it because it's a pretty pretty middle class thing. Of course, a lot of the people that we get here are not from here in town because we have a, a community care organization that's about two blocks away from here that is really great. And as long as you have a North Ridgeville address, um, they'll do whatever they can to help you out. And um, But, you know, so before we get into it further, um, this guy stole... Uh, microphones, laptop, computer containing a bunch of important records uh, from the Brian Baptist Church. 
He broke locks in the church's safe, but the safe was empty. Not a very strong safe if he <laughs> broke into it. I think you get a new well, safe. it could be. I, I know in our out at, at St. Luke's, uh, when our safe has money in it, it's closed. But when it's empty, we see no reason to lock it. I mean, why lock something that's empty? Right. Uh, matter of fact, it gets to be a pain because then if, like today, uh, you know, uh, I need to put some, you know, the offering in it, then I, you know, I have to go hunt down the combination because I don't know it. So, you know, I put the money in there and twist the handle and turn the dial and then it's locked and you know but it makes more sense to lock it when there's money in it mm-hmm. yeah that's true so i don't know it says it broke the he broke the safe maybe he didn't figure it out that you know i don't know but um you know here's the thing with this is you know we, we get all these requests and you always have to i'm i really have a hard time trying to figure out which requests are legitimate and which ones aren't and, it's, and I don't want to have to make that decision, but here's the problem. If I help one person, that means that there's somebody else that I can't help. <laughs> you know, I mean, and we talked about this a uh, week or two ago, that there's only so much money to help people. And, you know, so you get these calls and you want to help them. You want to say, yeah, here you go. What do you need? You know, let me help you out. And, mm-hmm. you know, we've got a standard policy that we don't give cash to anybody. Um but if you need a, um, a, a, I'll get you a, a gift card to a, I, I'm even reluctant to do a gift card to the grocery store because they could end up spending that on liquor or cigarettes or something like that that they don't really need. Um, I'm, you know, but like, I'm happy if someone stops by and they want to, you know, they're hungry. And if I say, look, here's some food, will you take it? I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm I'm very happy. To, right now we're doing a sock drive uh, at our church. Um, the, we did a tour of the of that uh, the homeless shelter a couple towns over, and found out that they have a huge need for socks, uh, especially men's socks, but uh, also women and children. And so we said, oh, well, gee, that's not that tough. We could come up with some socks. And so we talked about it and we decided, you know, especially this time of year, let's do like a little fireplace display and everyone can put their socks by the fire, you know, their stockings by the fireplace kind of thing. And, and someone actually had a, like a, 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 a fireplace, um, uh, just like a decorative one. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so they brought that in and they set it up in our narthex. And, and so there's this, Fireplace. I was thinking just like uh, you know poster board or something like that, but it's it's an actual fireplace, um, and and we've got baskets there for the different uh, kinds of socks, and um, and so we're gathering those. And and man, you go to Walmart and get a ten pack for like five bucks or something like that. And um, so there's just you know there's tremendous need, and uh, you know and we want to help people out and that. Um, but you know when people come in and they want to steal what's free. And the um the the pastor actually kind of joked. He said, uh, "Think about putting up a note to tell potential robbers to call him instead, and the church will take up a collection for him." <laughs> you know, I mean, mm-hmm. and the problem is, there's too many people that come by, and they don't really need it all that bad. They just, it, you know, they're going for an easy buck. And like, you want to help people out, but you know, if I give this to you and, and, and it's not a legitimate need, then, then somebody's going to come along that has a legitimate need and I can't give it to them. And, and how do I decide that? And especially this time of the year where we're getting, things are getting kind of tight for us and, and that just, we're getting kind of to the end of the year and that budget that we have set aside for those kind of needs is running out and, um, or well, okay. It Mm -hmm. ran out a long time ago, but the need is still there. And so we keep going beyond to help people out, but uh, just can't help everybody. Nope. You can't. And that's one of the frustrating things. We can't help everyone that we'd like to, but we do encourage people. I'm, uh, 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 our, our listeners, do what giving you can. Do what supporting you can. Uh, don't do it indiscriminately. 
don't be afraid to check out uh, sources or stories. I mean, I've been ripped off a few times. Um, and make sure, uh, yeah, but do let's, let's, if we, each of us does something, I think we can take care of a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, one of the yeah. things, uh, you know, Janice and I do is, uh, uh, through our church, we do this, the, uh, ho- we do, um, what we do? We did 30 holiday dinners through the town of Dedham. Um, and so we, we did one of those and now we're going to do another 30 for Christmas. And Janice and I did one of those. Um, and, uh, there's all, all kinds of other organizations, um, you know, especially things like Lutheran Social Services, uh, or uh, Catholic Charities and some of those organizations that you can do, do to help or just give your time. Uh, rescue missions, uh, Dale talked about the homeless shelter. There's all kinds of opportunities for giving mm-hmm. and for, for support. Um, you know, you know, we can do our best to take care. We're not going to take care of everybody. But we will take care of those we can, how we yep. can. Yep. And the other thing and, is, uh, um, don't just do it around the holidays. You know, there's sort of a big push this time of year, okay? Mm-hmm. And then it drops off in January and February, right? Go help then too. In fact, if you're gonna, if, if you only have a certain amount of time per year, don't do it around the holidays because they generally have extra help around that time. I mean, if you have time during the holidays, by all means, you know, but, uh, that's the time of year that everybody's sort of in the spirit and stuff and, you know, and wants to help out. So, uh, you know, contact them and say, uh, you know, when do you really need the help, um, more so than other times and, uh, and find out and, and make a point of, of emptying your schedule then and, and going then if you can. And if you happen to be a filthy rich person, like, um, I don't know, a Kennedy, you can give a lot more. <laughs> or Michael Moore, who just always who says he hates capitalism. But he got very rich from capitalism. Yeah, he did. <laughs> so he can give away, you know, a lot of his money. You know? <sighs> but but speaking of Kennedy. Too, you know, let's talk about patches. Um, now, of course, you have to live up here in New England uh, to understand that U.S. Representative Patrick Kennedy from Rhode Island, uh, his uh, nickname among all of us in Boston is Patches. So uh, uh, um, he is uh, a chip right off the old block, boy, I tell you. Or off the old bottle, too, come to think of that. Um, um, yeah. He's probably best known among us up right, up until this dispute with the, the bishop. He was best known for running his car drunk into the ca- into the uh, um, Jersey barriers around the Capitol. And then when he was stopped by the Capitol police, demanding saying that famous question, "Do you know who I am? I'm here for a vote." <laughs> so, this is the kind of intellect we're dealing with here, folks, when we talk about Patches Kennedy. Uh, another one of those guys, if his last name wasn't Kennedy, probably never have been elected. But <clears throat> anyway, so he's, he's Ted Kennedy's son, just to chip off the old block like his, like his old man. Um, <clears throat> if you can't tell, I have never been touched by the Mc- Kennedy mystique in Massachusetts. It's <laughs> not part of us up here. Anyway, so um, old Patches, he uh, was asked now, Quite a while ago, like last October, no, um, like last spring or summer, by uh, the uh, Bishop of um, Providence, Rhode Island, to uh, refrain from communion because he said, um, he just said, look, your position on abortion is beyond pro-choice, and it's not the position of the Catholic Church, and we don't think you should be taking communion for the sake of your own soul. And um, so old Patches, he sat on this for some time and everything, and all of a sudden, about three weeks ago, he makes a big public issue out of it. So Yeah, he really would have been better off just leaving that one alone. You yeah. know, the, because the there's... didn't make it public, he did. Yeah. Yeah, there's plenty of other politicians, even in the area, uh, that are 
Democrat, they're pro-choice. You know, not saying that Democrat is anti-Christian or anti-Catholic or anything, but they are pro-choice. And, uh, and it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's not even don't ask, don't tell. It's sort of don't bother us. We won't bother you, you know, kind of thing. Um, because it's, you don't have to ask their positions are public. Um, but in this case, he actually started taking pot shots at the Catholic church. Well, the issue has been is that uh, the U.S. Conference Catholic of Bishops. Now, on the one hand, the, 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 you know, the, the, the Bishops Conference has been very strongly behind uh, nationalized health care for some time. They wanted it back to uh, the days of the Carter administration. However, I mean, I don't know if it ever dawned on these guys that, you know, as far as many Democrats are concerned, uh, the only way that's going to pass is if it also includes uh, coverage for abortion, because they see that as a basic, as, as a simple medical issue instead of a moral, ethical issue. Uh, definitely don't see the unborn as really alive and living. So the, the Catholic, you know, the bishop said, look, if you want us to be able to go out and support this, which we really want to do, uh, you're going to have to protect the unborn in this. And, of course, that was like the uh, uh, the Stew Pack Amendment uh, that passed in the House. And, um, you know, he, Patches made it quite clear he didn't think that was a real good idea. And he thought the bishops should just keep their mouth shut and just do what he said, just do what the Democrats said. And so that's kind of what it came on out to. I wonder if he was drinking when he thought that. <laughs> oh, what a minute. It's Patches Kennedy. What isn't he drinking? <laughs> he was awake. <laughs> um, not touching that. But, um, you know, so here's, here's the big question. You know, on the one hand, we've got some people that say, uh, if they believe they're a true Catholic, who's to say they're not? Who's to say that they're not a Catholic? Well, then you kind of need to define what it is because, you know, if if I believe that I'm a true Catholic, but I, de I deny the divinity of Christ, then, um, uh, you know what? I'm believing, I, you know, I'm wrong in my beliefs. I'm, that, by definition, you can't say that I'm a part of this if my beliefs don't coincide with it. I have um, my beliefs, and the Pope has his beliefs, and I'm just as good a Catholic as he is. <laughs> yeah. Um, You've you got know, to I, understand that mindset, Dale. Yeah, I know, and I have trouble with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other hand, it's, you know, people to say, if you're going to be a Catholic, be a Catholic. You know? I think for some of the people, it, it's, it's, it's a... I was reading that this article uh, about this, you know, atheistic Jew... There's an atheistic Jewish synagogue now in uh, a, a town near here. I think I've mentioned that. In which you, you enjoy everything about being culturally Jewish, but you just don't have to deal with the God stuff. Well, and I think there's almost this cultural Catholicism, mm -hmm. uh, especially up here in Boston, you know, um, you know, which is this heavily Catholic enclave. And it's like, I want to be culturally Catholic, you know. Uh, and Canada and, and, and Patches, of course, being Irish. So it's really, you know, I mean, almost identify the Catholicism with the Irish, the Irish stuff. And but I don't really want to have to deal with the hassles of, of what the church really teaches. Right. Because, you know, they might stop like, you know, my dad's adultery, you know. Oh, that woman that died in Chappaquiddick. They might have a problem with that, too. But, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you, know, you know, and the reality is that. Um, I mean, and this is this is something that people need to realize in, in any denomination, and that is that people are members of churches for all different reasons. Sometimes it's a cultural thing. Sometimes it's because of your parents. Sometimes it's because of the vote. You know, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I don't I don't care how uh, how atheistic you are. If you want to run for um, for a major public office, like um, especially something nationwide, like president or something like that. Uh, you better find Jesus real fast, you know. I mean, which is sad, uh, but it's it's just the reality that uh, there's a whole lot of people. You know, that's what um, I'm, 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 another guy from Massachusetts. I'm drawing a blank on his name now. The Mormon. Oh, the Mitster, Mitt Romney. Yeah, yeah right. Um, 
you know, he really, no matter what his positions were, he really ultimately, I was surprised he went as far as he did, uh, being a Mormon. But I think that it's only the fact that they have Church of Jesus Christ, you know, in, in their name that a lot of people don't really know what Mormons teach and don't understand that their official teachings are pretty contrary to, um, to, uh, Orthodox Christianity. And so, uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if someone's going to come right out and say, you know, I, I'm not a Christian. So, but so people, I think, uh, I, well, yeah, the, I, I'm going to, which is sad because it would take away people like Ted, uh, like, um, uh, Jefferson. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a, that. <laughs> As a uh, as a president, and he, I think it was kind of effective. You know, doubled the size of the country with that. You know, losing at a purchase thing. You know, uh, uh, kind of scoped out the country with that Lewis and Clark thing. You know, so I, th- I think he was a you know an okay president. <laughs> uh, that that Constitution thing was pretty cool too, uh, and that Declaration of Independence. You know, like, that was a. So yeah, those are you know just minor little contributions he made along the way. Um, and then the other side of that, you know, uh, uh, Richard Nixon was Quaker, so he wasn't, you know, exactly Christian either. So, um, <clears throat> especially if you listen to his tapes, but uh, you know, you <laughs> didn't really know he wasn't. But, um, but if you're going to be, here's the question that you need to ask: If you're going to be a certain religion, whatever that religion is, whether it be patches and Catholicism, or it be um, uh, um, Michelle Bachman, who's Wisconsin Center Lutheran, go on another side. Um, do you, you know, how much do you allow your faith life to influence uh, your voting life? You know, uh, I don't know when, when um, I think was it last election that Michelle Bach was the one before that. As one, uh, um, that wasn't last year. It wasn't two last year. It was two thousand seven. Um, somebody asked Michelle Bachman about the Book of Concord, where it says that the Pope's the Antichrist. Was she anti-Catholic or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about that, and, and she didn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, she didn't know what they were talking about. You know, I mean, it, it's something that you know, uh, even Lutherans really d- discuss whether it's a it's a, it's a it's a doctrine or a historical judgment. I mean, that, even a lot of Lutherans make that you know question that issue. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going down that road. Anybody wants to know, but uh, um, the um, but here, you know, you have a question. Here, you have an issue that you know the, the Roman Catholic Church has spoken pretty, pretty, pretty strongly on that they are pro-life as a church. Do this? Do, does the church then have the right to tell the politicians, look, if you're going to be pro-choice and you're going to be openly pro-choice? And you're going to vote in line with that. And you're going to take pro money from uh, the National uh, 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 Abortion Rights Action League. And you're going to uh, uh, vote to pay for abortions with federal money. And you're going to be blatantly supportive of abortion. Then no, you're not going to take communion. Because we believe that what you're saying and doing is sinning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, openly doing it. Now, there's one guy that says um, there's a difference between being an abortion doctor, or procuring an abortion for yourself or your spouse, and saying, I don't think abortion should be illegal. All right. Now, this is a question of, um, uh, in some cases, of where, and we've talked about this uh, before and even recently, uh, is... Legislation doesn't change hearts. Well, we know it actually does um, from history, but uh, this, this that sort of mistaken mentality um, that you know we really need to uh, work with people on a on a on an individual level and and that kind of thing, and just discourage people from getting abortions. Or you know, there's those sort of ideas out there. I think it's bad but I can't impose my beliefs on somebody else, which personally I think is absolute hogwash because let me tell you something. If, um, 
no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, whether you're a Christian or an atheist or a Jew or a Muslim, your beliefs are going to impact the decisions you make and how you vote. I mean, it's your worldview. And quite frankly, if you're voting against your conscience and you're voting against, um, you know, unless you really truly feel that you're representing the, um, the beliefs of the people, I mean, if they elected you, then they should have elected you for who you are. And, uh, and I, I've got problems with that whole mentality that I can't let my beliefs dictate how I vote. I just, hmm. of course you do. Everybody does. I, you know, when I vote, I vote based on my beliefs. If you don't vote based on your beliefs or your worldview, what do you vote based on? Who gives me the money? Uh, He's a yes. professional politician. <laughs> There are two things professional politicians care about. Number one, getting elected. Number two, getting reelected. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And the only way to get reelected is to get lots and lots of money so you can run lots and lots of ads. So, you see, I, I you know, or if you have no competition to run against, like Patches, like Patches never has, um, you get lots and lots of money so that you have lots and lots of money to give to lots and lots of friends so you have lots and lots of chits to pull call in when you want to. This whole political discussion makes me feel dirty. I think we should just move on. We're uh, sticking with the Catholic Church and their teachings, and uh, let's move over to their discussions with the Church of England. Right? Where they're uh, trying to patch over things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, <sighs> the, 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 the title for this episode, folks, is, you know, Patches and More Patches. You know, so. <laughs> uh, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, tell the story. All right. So now um, it was just a, a month or two ago that the uh, Roman Catholic Church sort of said, uh, hey, you know, all you Anglicans that are not real content with all of the liberal movement within the Anglican church, um, <laughs> come over here to, to Rome. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury is, uh, trying to, um, chat with Pope Benedict to say, Hey, you know, um, we're not really all that different. Um, and yeah, you know, there's some things, but you know, let's just talk women's ordination for a minute. Uh, is that really that big of a deal that it's got to be one of the issues that divide us? Cause we've got a lot in common. And you know, Rome's going to say, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was it was sort of like the uh, guy that called me looking for money the other day, um, that told me that he attends a Catholic church and um, and had attended a Lutheran churches, and you know they're pretty much the same. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we we certainly have our similarities. You know, there's certain uh, things that we uh, both agree on that, um, you know, at the same time. Especially when you talk Rome and um, and the Anglican Communion, well, there's some pretty major differences there. I mean, Missouri Synod Lutherans have more in common with Rome than the Anglican Communion does. Well, it depends on part of the Anglican Communion. Well, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> you know, it uh, right. I mean, uh, um, I mean, you do have your your your. Uh, High Church um, pseudo Catholic Anglicans uh, definitely exist, um, but uh, you know, <clears throat> but it really his, his article basically is is um, you know um, is this really that big of a deal? Doesn't need to be church dividing. Do the arguments advance about the essence of male and female vocations and capacities stand on the same level as a theology derived more directly from Scripture and our common theological heritage? And basically, you would notice that uh, more directly. In other words, 
The view of Rome that there should be a male-only clergy is not derived directly from Scripture. That's that's what he's arguing. Mm-hmm. Because God knows Paul really didn't write uh, Timothy. Paul never really said uh, uh, um, that Adam was born first, uh, was created first, then Eve. And that uh, women should not be uh, 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 exercise authority within the congregation. Well, you know, or you could take the approach that I heard during the whole um, the whole discussion on gay clergy with the ELCA when I was talking to people on Twitter that said, "You're going to let the opinion of one man uh, determine your doctrine," <laughs> you know. <laughs> which I said, well, if by one man you mean the Holy Spirit? Yes. <laughs> yeah, guy, guy, you know, under un, under the direct guidance of the Spirit, I would think so. Uh, so I mean, you know, he, you know, he, and 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 if this Archbishop, you know, Archbishop Rowan think, thinks thinks this, uh, 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 Williams thinks this, this, you know, this is at all realistic. He obviously does not know Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, good news. He's not a Brit guy. He's a old crowd, stubborn old crowd. If there ever was one. <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, uh, like the, this article ends, his argument seemed unlikely to convince the Vatican, which sees the disarray among Anglicans as proof that churches need clear doctrines and firm leadership. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you take a look at the fact, even if you're going to talk women's ordination, right, the Anglican communion cannot even agree with itself. It's very sharply divided on this. So... To say, hey, look, you're not much different from us. Well, some of us, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, before you're going to tell other people what they ought to do, shouldn't you kind of figure it out yourself first? Right. So, uh, right, it, it, there's a, you know, uh, uh, and, and frankly, uh, he says, the question is whether this unfinished business is as fundamentally church-dividing as our Roman Catholic friends generally assume and maintain. Well, guess what? Rome's answer to that is, you betcha. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, with so many of these discussions, really a lot of it comes down to not so much that particular issue. You know, it's it's just like when we talked about the ELCA. I'm sorry, I keep breaking that up, but it's kind of fresh. Um that that whole question of of uh, gay clergy, it wasn't really a question of sexuality. It was a question of your approach to scripture, right? And the churches that um, that ordain and and someone can correct me on this, um, but at least the majority of the churches that ordain women um, are do not have a very high view of scripture. Now, does the assembly, assembly God ordains women, don't they? Yes. Yeah, okay. And so they're the exception to that. And um, so because they have a pretty high view of Scripture. They have a very high view of Scripture. So. But they would argue, they're, they're argue and that would depend on which, which assembly of God you would talk, talk to. But then they would talk about, um, because it, it comes under how I feel gifted and called by the Spirit. Okay. Yeah. You know, so it's it's it's. Uh, I mean, they also ordain twelve year olds. Okay. So uh, <laughs> true. Yeah. No, I I, I knew uh, the the chaplain uh, that I trained under um, when I was at seminary uh, um, was started out in the assemblies of God, and he said he started preaching when he was eight. So right. So yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, there you have the sort of. Um, what would you call it? Continuing revelation, or well, no, I probably wouldn't use that term. It's, um, but it's it's similar to that. Um, so yeah, it, but just this whole approach to scripture—that's what is dividing Rome and England. Okay, <laughs> it's it's how you view scripture. It, it's not these other issues. Those other issues are just symptoms of the problem. So, 
That's for sure. But let's go over to the other little patch in the Vatican here uh, and, and in Rome. And um, this uh, researcher from the Vatican, uh, Dr. Bar- Barbara Frail, who um, is a researcher in the Vatican secret archives. You want to sound like says, a job. <laughs> yeah, really. Real letters from Peter. Anyway, uh, you know. Well, I wonder if the Da Vinci Code guy ever got a hold of this one. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine all the dirt she can to give him. Anyway, um, uh, she says that on the, uh, 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 the, uh, Shroud of Turin, that Jesus' burial certificate was glued onto it. See, it was a little patch on the side. That's where my, my little patch of joke comes in here. Um, and, uh, that she has now found Jesus' burial certificate on it and um, says uh, Jesus was referred to as Jesus of Nazareth and the only Iber um, of Tiberu sur- surviving. Now, it doesn't say exactly what is... Uh, it says that m- many of the letters were missing. It doesn't say how many. I mean, she comes up with... Um, in the year 16 of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, Jesus the Nazarene taken down in the early evening after having been condemned to death by a Roman judge because he was found guilty by a Hebrew authority, is hereby sent for burial with the obligation of being consigned to his family only after one full year. Um, but I, I'd like to know more about um, you know, exactly what, the, what was actually printed on the thing rather than what... <laughs> Right, because she it says that meant. she got this out of the um, reconstructed from fragments of Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. All right, right there. Here's my question: Why, if this was an official Roman um, burial or death certificate, why would it have Hebrew writing on it? Greek, I can sort of understand, and yes, he is Jewish, but. If this is for the sake of Roman legal records, why would they have it written in Hebrew? I mean, who the heck would write it? Uh, the average Roman wouldn't know Hebrew. No, but, uh, well, probably actually not Hebrew, but actually probably Aramaic uh, would be much, much more likely. But uh, if you remember Jesus, uh, and I, I think it came up uh the uh, title is above Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, I mean, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Yeah. So that, that it was would have reflected. Different. If you read the actual article, from, because this is a BeliefNet uh, um, um, blog here, if you go to um, the, 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 the Times of, uh, of, of London, yeah, they argue that it, in there that it's uh, reflective of the uh, polyglot nature of that area. I suppose, given that it was actually in Jerusalem. Okay, fine. I'll give you that. But um, she goes on to point out that, um, you know, if you look at John nineteen thirty eight and following, talking about Joseph of Arimathea, that um, what is the point of the Roman authorities holding the body for a year in a common grave? Because they said that they would do that placing death certificate on the burial cloth for later retrieval. That what's the point of that if his body was handed over to Joseph of Arimathea right away? It never was put in there. And Joseph of Arimathea made that request while he was still on the cross. Right. Well, it goes back to the whole question, really, of authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. Right. That's the question. Do you take it as authentic or not? Um, and I know uh, um, people like Paul Meyer uh, believe it's a medieval forgery. Matter of fact, back in 1988, when they took part of the, the cloth and cut it away and for carbon dating, it you know dated. Um, I think it was I think the cloth itself dated old and old in it, but but the the the, the pigment and stuff did, um, was dated back to the medieval ages. How they did it, that's still a big question that, you know, you know, most of the time when we see it, you know, we actually don't see the shroud because you really can't see anything on the shroud. What most people see is the photographic negative where you see this body and stuff, which, okay, how did that happen that, you know, 
basically you're going to try to get a photographic negative. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, how how did things like that? But you know, where it came from and stuff, I can't remember the whole history of it exactly. Uh, it kind of showed up in the medieval ages, but it is the question: Is this authentic? Yeah, and uh, I, I'm not and, a uh, an archaeologist, and and that you know to determine that. And you know, I mean, the other question comes down to: Does it matter? Right. And ultimately, um, no, it doesn't. It seemed to be odd that the people I heard talk mostly about it back when it, when it, when it was what, the 1970s. It really first came out. It was really kind of a big deal. I think it was or the 80s. The 80s first came out. <clears throat> I was at Concordia, Ann Arbor, and um, the it was it was the fundamentalists who I heard make the biggest deal out of it because this proved the resurrection. It proved the Bible was real. And not understanding that the Bible is a self-authenticating book. Mm -hmm. That, as a friend of mine like said, Luther, I think, was supposed to have said, you defend the Bible like you defend the lion. You open the door and get out of the way. <laughs> you know, God will do his own defending. Thank you very much. He doesn't mm -hmm. need us to do it for him. Right. Right. And, 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 you know, and that's how when I talk to people, and in fact, right, I, right before this, I was actually leading a study on, um, on the Word of God. And in fact, it's, it's up as a podcast, uh, if anybody's interested in it. It's on our church website, um, or it's in the iTunes directory. Uh, and it's basically responding to arguments about the Word of God. And, uh, and is the Bible the word of God? And it's a document that was written by an atheist. And um, really w what it comes down to is how do you answer his his claims? We actually go into the word and we can actually find the answers there that debunk his claims. You know, like, for instance, he says that, um, that well, we know from reading it that Ecclesiastes was written by an atheist. And, uh, and you you go and verse one says the um writings of the son of david the king of jerusalem you know or king of israel and um you know and well we know that was solomon and uh solomon was known for his wisdom writings so why would solomon not have written this there's no you know and he says we know that this is the case when no nobody you know nobody can prove it otherwise um, so, you know, and we've been going through like that and, and yet the Bible, it does, you know, people say, well, isn't that circular reasoning to say the Bible claims to be the word of God? Therefore it is. Ah, but the problem is the Bible shows itself to be the word of God. And, uh, and, and, you know, we've looked at that many times, um, you know, prophecies and, and just all kinds of stuff that, um, that shows that this is no ordinary book. Now, if you don't want it to be, um, if you really firmly believe that it's not, or you just disagree with the, um, with the, with the, the principles and the concepts in it. And, you know, I've talked to friends, atheist friends that say, um, well, I just, I, I can't believe in a, in a God who's not completely just and the cross, um, God sending his son to pay for the sins of somebody else and the son, the innocent son gets killed and the, and the guilty one goes free. That's just not just. And so I can't believe in that, in that God. Well, God is also love, you know? And, uh, so if, if you've got a problem with it, well, I, you know, then it comes down to man's wisdom versus God's. And, uh, you know, and, and sometimes we just have to step aside and say, all right, God, you've got it figured out. I don't. And, uh, and I'm going to leave this one up to you. So, so yeah, you can defend the word of God, but the word of God defends itself. You just point out the places where it does. And, uh, and, but you don't need, you know, it's like the, um, uh, the, the Noah's Ark, you know, they've had these, these groups. And, and one time it was, um, oh, a couple different creationist groups. Uh, that were, uh, one of them, uh, Morris, I think it is, was, he was really trying to find it. And, and, and he says, you know, we've been, we've been praying and praying and, and that, that God would 
would show us Noah's Ark and, and reveal it to us and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and there was another group and I can't remember if it was Ken Ham's group or somebody else that said, Oh, well, we've been praying that you don't. <laughs> Why? Because if it's ever found, people will worship it, you know? And or once again, th- there's proof. There's proof. That the Bible's real. Right. We can now prove the Bible is real. We can now prove the Bible's word of God, but that's, the trick for fundamentalists is that you begin by proving the Bible's the word of God. Then you worry about the gospel. And you get to a bibliolatry where you worship the Bible, not Jesus. And it's a very, very fine line that we have to draw. But we must always remember the word points to Jesus. The word does not point to itself. So... Now, I enjoyed a lot of what you said, Dale. You have stuff, but you know, you said this stuff on Saudi TV, you'd be killed. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I haven't predicted the future. So, I don't know if I'd really be considered a witch. Um, <laughs> this, this article really cracked me up. Um, we, we've got a guy by the name of Ali Sibat. Um, he's Lebanese. He's Lebanese. He's he's a Lebanese citizen. He's not from Saudi Arabia, but he was visiting Saudi Arabia on pilgrimage, and he was arrested uh, in Medina last year. And it was a court in the city condemned him as a witch on November 9th. The evidence presented was reportedly the claim that he appeared regularly on Lebanese satellite, issuing general advice on life and making predictions about the future. And so he's been condemned to death. Um, they say. Why do I see a Monty Python routine here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a witch. What do you mean I'm a witch? I'm not a witch. <laughs> does, does he yeah, this? I'm still a witch. <laughs> well, witch. you know. <laughs> Let's throw him in the water. Let's see if he floats. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that proof. It'll prove he's a witch. <laughs> what if he drowns? He is still a witch. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, that would simplify things, right? Just see if he weighs the same as a duck. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I, I'm thinking. Why did I the would, South even take the time to worry about the trial? <laughs> I, I'm just thinking I would hate to be a Saudi meteorologist. Of course, yeah, really. if they're as accurate as the meteorologists here in the Cleveland area, <laughs> they have nothing to worry about. <laughs> it's going to rain tomorrow. Which, yeah. uh, you know, oh, um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <coughs> or, or, or for that matter, a stockbroker. <laughs> the stock's going to go down. The devil speaks through him. <laughs> Which anyway, I mean, this is just this is just, um, I mean, well, issuing general advice on life, dear Abby and Landers, they're not only Jews, they're witches, <laughs> they're Jewish witches, they're witches. <laughs> um, so, two other people have been arrested on similar charges in the last month, uh, and uh. See, so we got an Asian man is accused of using supernatural powers to solve marital disputes and induce others to fall in love. So now marriage counseling is is witchcraft. Oh, I'm in trouble. And then, of course, uh, well, this was, uh, uh, um, yeah, um, my 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 favorite here is in 2006. A guy from uh, Eritrea um, was uh, p- uh, accused of charlatanry. Yeah, charlatanry. Charlatanry. Um, yeah, I guess that's how you pronounce it. I don't know. Charlatanry. Charlatanry. I've never heard of the word before. He's a charlatan. Um, yeah, I know. Being a being a charlatan. Yeah. Uh, because he possessed a phone book that contained writings in the Tigria alphabet used in Eritrea. I mean, come on. Uh, I mean, uh, Eritrea. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> he's got a Chinese phone book with Chinese writing in it. <laughs> he must be a witch. <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> he weighs like a duck does. <laughs> if it walks a like sudden, a duck, talks like a duck. Must be a fish. Must be a fish. Looking be a witch. real <laughs> or looking, you know, more logical. Than what's going on literally in the Saudi government. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Patches, we need your help. These guys are going to take away the witch capital from Salem. (laughs) This is the problem you need to go solve. Oh, but he's Rhode Island. He's not um, Massachusetts. Yeah, but his, 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 you know. (laughs) His home is here. Now this this is this is the this is the national emergency here. You know how many tourist dollars coming to Salem? We might lose our witch school to these people. <laughs> and they pay taxes. They're not a That's nonprofit right. organization. That's right. You know, so um here's an issue we need to take care of. Oh, this, this is this is I feel so bad for these people. Fortunately, you know, I mean you know, human rights, the Middle East director at Human Rights Watch is just, you know, kind of beside herself with, you know, the, the ludicrousness of this. They just like, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, what, what do you even begin to say? You know, how would you even respond to this in a, you know, you're, it's like you're in um, Wonderland. You know, yeah. or you are in the middle of a Monty Python routine. Yeah, where it nothing really makes feels sense. like one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely absurd. You know, yeah. we've at different times we, we've sort of laughed at um, at people for for their reactions, for their beliefs, different things, and and usually we end up apologizing for that uh, because sometimes we kind of go overboard. This one, this is just flat out ridiculous. I don't care who you are. All right. I don't care what you believe, but arresting a guy because he's got a phone book written in his native tongue, arresting a guy because he makes predictions about the future. I mean, who doesn't? You think it's going to rain tomorrow? You know, or, you know, are you, are you going to, um, am I going to spend this money? Do I expect to, um, to still have a job a month from now or do I need to kind of save my money? I mean, everybody makes predictions about the future, unless this guy is, you know, on the nose every time, uh, then I I really can't imagine any reason to even call him a witch, much less execute him for it. And, and, and quite frankly, if he is on the nose every time, he may be a true prophet, and <laughs> you better not mess with him. <laughs> yeah. And the really sad part is he's there making a pilgrimage to Medina. Yeah, <laughs> he's there. Yeah, he's doing the Hajj. I mean, he's a faithful Muslim doing his yeah. faithful Muslim stuff. People, right. yeah. If he weren't, he wouldn't be doing this. You know, he's he's spending this his own money to do this, and you know, and 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 setting aside his life as a uh, this poor guy. Yeah, it's you just yeah. This is just Ali. Um, you know, I want to tell you. I know he's not watching this. Because he's in jail somewhere, but <laughs> here, here in in the, the Christian Church, uh, we don't execute people for and call them witches for ridiculous reasons. Now I know it's happened in the past. All right, that was one little fringe group that was doing that, and uh, and we don't. And they did it for good reasons. <laughs> they knew there was money to be made in that, that <laughs> yeah. accusation. Just ask the people of Salem. They don't have anything else going on up there, but they got money from people coming to see the witchcraft stuff. I tell you though, it was this week I was playing Uno on Facebook and I got attacked by I can the best I can figure out based on the little bit of information I was able to glean from him is that he was uh um that he was a Muslim or some other um sort of group like that and um but he was he was bashing on Americans and um, assumed first of all he assumed that because I was American that I must be unemployed <laughs> and, and then when he found out that I was a, um, a, a Lutheran 
he assumed that I was a member of the Ku Klux Klan and that, and, and, and said, you burn crosses. <laughs> Are you KKK? I said, no, LCMS.org. <laughs> I'm going, what? You know, he's like, all oh, Lutherans. And then he actually changed it to Protestants. Are all white supremacists? Like, where are you getting this information? And, I mean, it was just—it was bizarre. Um, From the same guys who arrested him. Well, you know, and that's the thing—is this sort of—it's—it's um, it's this. Well, I'm just going to listen to the moms or whatever, and I'm going to let them do my thinking for me. And and I'm not going to think clearly at all. I'm not going to actually stop and ask, does this make sense? You know? I mean, when you become at least, and I'm not saying this is true of all Muslims, right? But in in the Middle East, in the, 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 the sort of, the people that are in power there, I mean, when you become that kind of Muslim, check your brain at the door. You know, don't ask questions because, man, you do. We will shut you up real quick. We're not going to bother answering your questions, you know. Which? <laughs> so. I mean, that's what, I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. It's, it's stuff like this and that bad enough that it goes on. But then that the, the official Saudi Arabian government doesn't do anything about it. The yeah, House of Saud. sanctioned. You know, the, you know, this government sanction, it allows it to go on. Um, that's that's what's really sad. You know, the government needs to stand up against something like this and say, no, this is not right. You know, release the man, give him his freedom. He hasn't done it. He hasn't broken any laws. He hasn't done anything wrong. So, uh, anyway. <sighs> Folks, I'll tell you. Oh, look. Okay, we have a YouTube comment. Let's let's move on to the YouTube comment here because you you were getting tired of patches earlier. I tell you, I can't deal with this story anymore. My my mind just you know. All right, so we got we we were talking last time about atheism, and um, and the the meaning of life uh, to an atheist, and so we got a comment uh, on YouTube, a uh, rather long one and a, and a really good one, uh, well thought out. It says, besides being a V watcher, and we mentioned that show on last episode, I'm both former LCMS and current atheist. I don't really have an issue with summarizing the purpose of life as self-determined. I generally find that those purposes fall broadly into three categories, loving, learning, and creating. I don't find permanence a necessary ingredient to a real purpose. Of course, my rights to self-determination is constrained by my rights to swing my fist stopping near the end of your nose. I find the Christian answer, at even an operational, definitional level, less desirable than my own, even though heaven-hell is supposed to be the ultimate carrot or stick. While most Christian apologists premise their superiority over an atheist purpose on, at least in part, its permanence, they quickly retreat from this permanence when pushed on the question, suppose instead of eternal life, you and God only endured for a billion years more. Then the case is shifted to the greater nature and righteousness of God. But if at its heart self-determination is not the source of purpose, the Christian is reduced to either being God's tool, God's pet, or God's slave, all of which sound like even worse outcomes to me than non-existence. Have Christians been brutally honest with what they really believe? All right. Good, well-thought-out response. Thank you. Thank you so much for an intelligent response instead of just, you guys are dumb, you know, or something like that. All right. So... Awesome. Awesome comments. Really appreciate it. Jim, got a response? Put you on the spot. I'm going to let you respond. <laughs> but All right. That's fine. I, I actually... Sick. Okay. Fair enough. I, I actually spend a lot of time talking to um, to atheists because I've got a lot of friends who are. So, um, I, you know, I deal with questions like this all the time. Um, not that I'm by any means an expert, um, but... Uh, the first of all, this question of um, suppose instead of eternal life, you and God only endured for a billion years more. Um, I think that that's kind of I. The question itself, I don't know that I could answer it just because um, then my God's not big enough. 
Um, but even even if that's the case, for one, I I can't even I can't fathom eternity. I can't fathom a billion years either. All right, it's beyond my comprehension. Um, I still think that would be a pretty decent alternative. Um, and really, I don't think it's so much the matter of time. I mean, eternity is <laughs> cool. All right. But I don't think it's so much the permanence as being um, the just the fact that there is meaning. Now, obviously, if if all of this actually was going to come to an end, um, by all of this I mean I mean God and, and this entire um, you know reality, um, in in the sense of beyond just this universe. Okay, um, I, I think that. Well, you run into that same problem. For me, it's really the the idea that this all makes sense. It wouldn't make sense if if even God were gonna come to an end at some point. Um, then again, we're back to that sort of randomness that how did things come about or or or, or how do things end or, or whatever. Um, but it's the whole idea that everything makes sense. Everything ties together. All right, that there's a purpose, that there's a direction. And as I look at creation, all right, if you'll allow me to use that term, uh, I see purpose in it. I see direction. I see order. I see things that fall into place, even to the point where when I hear people talking about uh, evolution and, and, um, and different, uh, you know, natural laws and, and things like that, I hear, I hear them saying, you know, and then evolution pushes things in this direction and, and uses this sort of, it, it's almost impossible to talk about natural processes without personifying it. You know, I've heard people talk about um, uh, dark matter, which we don't even know exists. It's called dark matter because we don't know anything about it. But there's some force that is stronger than gravity that is affecting the things in the universe. No one can nail it down what it is. So they're calling it dark matter. All right. But, you know, it could be anything. It could be God, but we're not going to allow that. You know, um, we're, because the problem is even our laws of physics and, and, and stuff that of what we know, it's not, it doesn't always correspond with what we see. So what happens when you're, um, when the evidence doesn't match your theories. You've got a problem. And, um, and that's the whole purpose of this, uh, this, uh, hate large Hadron collider and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, so, you know, is there such a thing as dark matter? Pfft. You know, I mean, like, is there actually some sort of matter that, that we can't detect, um, that they might actually find someday? Pfft. I don't know. Maybe I, you know, It'd be kind of interesting if if there were. It would it would certainly open up a whole new area of of the study of physics. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I tend to think maybe they won't find anything. Maybe this is an area where God does act outside of of nature. Um, but really, I guess what it comes down to is that I see purpose, I see order, I see design, and you know, there's just. And, and you know we talked a little bit about uh the bible and and the the, the prophecies in the bible uh that that have, that came true in Jesus and how much uh points uh, of the old testament points to Jesus and so here he comes along and and i mean there's there's things that happened that he could not have engineered and yeah you could say that um that he he that they, they just sort of made this stuff up afterward. But all it would have taken is one person to say, nope, didn't happen, and write it down somewhere. And uh, that would have been it. That didn't happen. And not only that, but the eyewitnesses, they were willing to go to their deaths and endure excruciating torture for a story that if, if it didn't actually happen, if they just made it up, it would make no sense for every single one of them to stick to it. Um, as far as, uh, our relationship with God, I guess I don't see it. I, I don't see the God's tool, God's pet, God's slave. Um, while I would be happy to be any of those, 
um, I believe that that we're more than that, and uh, that you know that he really loves us. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone through so much for us. Uh, I mean, he did more for me than. Well, I mean, he endured hell. You know, uh, in a in a short time period, uh, while he was hanging on the cross, I I don't know that I would do that for anybody. And uh, I mean, that's that's pretty intense, right there. I I just I don't see how, and and I I would welcome feedback. I, I'd be interested in in continuing this discussion. Um, but I, I just I don't see it being reduced to that. That the purpose is God loves us and He wants us to be blessed. Uh, he wants to have a relationship with us. You know, I, I mean, I guess to use the illustrations, you know, why does uh, why do we have kids, right? Um, because they're our tools or our pets or our slaves? No, just because you know, taking it back to God, God is love, and Love desires an object. Now, God is is the, the as a Trinity. He loves the you know the different persons of the Trinity love each other, and it's kind of hard to talk about um, just because of our language doesn't work real well with a triune being. Um, so it's not that that he's somehow lacking something, but he created mankind to love us. And, uh, and, and, and that's what it comes down to. We have a hard time with that because we tend to have an ulterior motive. You know, people have kids to, um, to carry on the family name or, or, uh, because it'll make them feel good or, or whatever. God just got us love. He wants to love. And, uh, and so he creates beings to love. And, uh, and I know, I mean, it's, a. Uh, there are philosophers that when you really get into some of that stuff um, that that can answer those questions better than I can. Um, that's kind of my nutshell answer for a YouTube video, you know, um, but, uh, and, you know, and as far as we could get more detailed on that, I'd be happy to talk about it some more. Um, I will recommend if, if you're, you or any other uh, atheists that are watching this, um, if you're really serious about about your position on this, the, my question to you is: Are you willing to be challenged? Sorry, our sound kind of went out on us, so um, I'm just gonna wrap this up. It's getting late here, and um, so uh, just in summary, if you if this is what you believe, um, then allow yourself to be challenged. All right, I'd make a point of of listening to uh, to other beliefs, other worldviews and that, I found it's really helpful to me uh, to just get a better understanding of who people are, what they believe, and why. And uh, so uh, check out, and I'll recommend Ravi Zacharias, uh, who is much better versed in these things. He's got a, uh, because he's lived in all different parts of the world, uh, he comes from, uh, originally from India um, and uh, is, is well versed in, in a lot of these discussions. I'm going to recommend him. Uh, go check him out. He's got a podcast and, and different things. Uh, there's other uh, Christian apologists out there too, but I really enjoy listening to him. And uh, and hear him out. And allow yourself to consider, you know, what he has to say and, and how does that stack up to your beliefs. Love to hear more from you. Um, love to to kind of get your feedback on that, continue this discussion. So, but thanks again for this uh for the feedback. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, so anybody else, we'd love to hear from you, whether you're watching this on YouTube, uh, whether you are uh, or on any of the other file sharing sites, and um, or if you're you know, if you're listening to the podcast, you can send us an email at podcast at crossbeatnews.com. And uh, so thanks, everybody. Uh, sorry about the uh, problem at the end there. Um, but thanks for tuning in, and uh, hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving, and uh, wish you all a very blessed Advent season, and uh, we'll see you again real soon. Have a night. God bless.